morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this panel. Um, I'm delighted to um, have these three panelists today talking about the real work that they're doing to fight climate change. Um, very often, people, when they think about blockchain, they, they ask us, you know, is blockchain a solution looking for a problem? Um, what you'll learn today from the panelists is that it isn't, um, and that the, we are really solving some critical uh, climate-related um, uh, items uh, using blockchain and blockchain-related um, uh, technologies as well. Um, so we have the panelists that come from uh, a platform that um, is solving sustainability, um, and we'll let everybody introduce themselves, their roles, and their company. Um, we have you know uh, Kem Lashier representing also a lot of work that's happening in Asia Pacific, um, and Nancy, uh, who works for the government of British Columbia, um, that really has uh, shown, and I hope that today will will you'll learn how much work and effort they have put into the projects that they've um, worked on. So Nancy, I'll start with you since you're over on that side. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. My name is Nancy Norris. I work for the government of British Columbia in Canada. I'm not going to go through my whole title because it's uh, very wordy. Um, but uh, my team works on a project, a pilot project called the Energy and Mines Digital Trust. And we're using distributed ledger technology to um, enable uh, natural resource uh, operators within the province of British Columbia to pass on information about their sustainability performance. So in BC, we have um, you know, an economy that uh, in part is based on natural resource extraction. Uh, we also have very strong uh, climate legislation and we are making investments in digital trust technology. So those three things combined um, really sort of moved us forward to work on this pilot. Um, where we're using a technology called verified credentials um, to enable uh, companies to pass on information in a way that's trusted and secure. Uh, so the, the pilot itself is mapping an existing process that is uh, a part of our legislation in British Columbia. Anyone who admits, uh, emits uh, GHGs over a particular threshold uh, must um, report that those uh, emissions on an annual basis to the government. So what we're doing is piloting the use of uh, digital credentials to um, so that the auditor, the car carbon auditor, issues one of these credentials. The holder of that credential is the mining operator or the natural gas operator. And then the, um, the, the consumer of those credentials is, uh, in our pilot, it is the BC regulator, the Climate Action Secretariat. Uh, we're also enabling uh, those natural resource operators to be able to share that information with other um, end consumers of that data, like voluntary climate accounting platforms, uh, such also digital markets that are springing up for um, responsibly sourced products. So uh, we are really seeing this technology as an opportunity uh, to uh, allow BC operators to showcase all of the hard work that they're doing to reduce their carbon footprint on an annual basis. We'll also be extending it to um, other digital credentials around um, the social and governance side. Uh, so of the, the ESG, so basically just the, the overall sustainability performance of, of mines and natural gas operators. Hi, uh, I'm Kamlesh Nagwari, and uh, I'm CTO at Estimate Future Tech, uh, is a high pressure member company. And I'm also an uh, active member in the high pressure community since 2016, and a uh, core member of Climate Action Accounting, SIG, which working on such kind of projects and uh, initiatives in the climate action. So we are doing a couple of projects uh, in India, especially for the kind of plastic recycling. So like how the plastic is recycled and how you could do the carbon emission footprint and then tokenizing those kind of plastic credits and uh, that we are working with few customers in India and a uh, couple, couple, couple of customers in the renewable energy space so in India there's some rural economies where they are using some kind of coal or uh, wind energy uh, we call and some kind of water energy so how how we are 
we are working with one of the our European customers. They are uh, set up some kind of microgrid in India and then uh, accounting the how much uh, they are using uh, the renewable energy and how much carbon footprint they are saving. And then tokenizing in some kind of uh, is a is a carbon credit token, whether it is a deploy in a hyperledger tokens or some kind of uh, kind of e polygon or some kind of other other tokens. So they are working and also in the active member of the community of the climate action accounting group. We started this two years before with Sidechain, uh, Robin, Sirwood and we started some kind of forming some kind of standards or some kind of what are the different use cases could be built around it. So and then we created one climate uh, carbon accounting and certification working group. We started with normal some kind of proof of concept using the hyperledger fabric for accounting some carbon footprint and then we extended this to the further kind of uh, using some kind of tokenizing of this different carbon footprint in a different difference with the supply chain with their greenhouse emission gases and some already audited uh, uh, credits and this is live in production i think we went live in production uh, last month and I think anybody can go and use this uh, open source platform, open source code and build around the, their climate action accounting kind of projects. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Conrad van Deventer, uh, CTO at Circular. And uh, we develop, we've developed a uh, material traceability platform to track um, materials f throughout the supply chain for big organizations. So from the mine to through manufacturing until the final product has been created um, in order to create um, just more visibility for organizations to be able to see and be able to know where materials really come from in their supply chains it's not just a one-time exercise and then when the supply chain changed they're not aware of it as we're getting the data from all the suppliers all of that is recorded and um, they're aware of all the time where it is coming from so when we've created this to track material initially we can also use that same data to then calculate the greenhouse gas emissions so by combining the actual material that's uh, processed the items that's produced we can then apply um, co2 protocols like ipcc uh, on top of that by using the energy um, that's the amount of energy that's used by those companies attribute that to those materials in order to help the companies determine the scope one, two, and also the scope three emissions that's coming through their supply chain. So Conrad, as CTO of Circular, um, I'm sure you get a lot of questions of why blockchain um, is being used and what are the principles of uh, blockchain technology that help. Can you tell the audience today how you describe blockchain, how you describe your use of Hyperledger Fabric within the circular uh, platform to a customer, to a Volvo, to a Jaguar, to these large car manufacturers where sometimes the word blockchain might not be um, uh, you know, the nicest thing that you can say to them. So if you can just explain to us why blockchain, why blockchain in the circular platform is in, an important element of it, and then how do you describe that importance? Uh, whether you use the word or not, to your customers and to the, um, the participants in that network. Yeah. Um, yeah, so normally when we work with organizations, um, we sell it as a traceability solution and we're trying to help them um, determine, get transparency and visibility in their supply chains. Sometimes when we talk to a customer after a while, they say, well, you guys should use blockchain or why don't you? And actually what's underpinning this is a blockchain um, is Hyperledger Fabric underneath. But we don't sell it as a blockchain solution and then trying to find where we need to apply it. We're looking for real world problems and trying to solve those problems. And Hyperledger Fabric blockchain component is just a component in there that enables that um, transparency or that credibility, depending on what reporting is needed because we, because our plat on our platform, because we're sort of an independent third party, we can get data from um, the, the whole range of suppliers which are um, supplying materials to four or five or ten different customers, but they only want to share, whether we, only, we need to ensure that only the relevant data is shared with the right customer so that nobody gets uh, benefit in 
like nobody wants to expose who all their customers are. So through blockchain technology and security, we can implement that and have a single place where we can have the evidence for it. But it's it, at the end of the day, it's, we're solving a problem that's there already, and blockchain is enabling the solution. Yeah, so I think I may agree with the. Uh, with now I think the customer understand the like uh, why blockchain. I think no need to explain them why they need to implement blockchain because I'm working with some customer now they come forward and ask like uh, I want to implement fabric for particular this particular piece in the system, and then I understand like tokenization because they want to do some secondary marketplace of the tokens they want to use the public blockchains but in the accounting perspective they are very clear uh, like for example I give an example like currently I was discussing with one uh, potential customer in uh, India and in India there is a uh, end of life end of vehicle life policy okay, you need to recycle or kind of scrap the vehicle and this particular company actually uh, doing some kind of uh, accounting or some kind of how much carbon footprint will save when the particular vehicle will be scrapped so they are very clear in mind they want to use the hyperledger fabric because they don't meet a millions of vehicle need to be scrapped every year and you can't put this data on a, some kind of public blockchain with a, with a case fees or some kind of other factors about the scalability so they are very clear they want to do the this uh, data recording and confirm on a, on a permission blockchain like fabric and they want to use if even fabric could provide the tokenization kind of they are happy to if they don't want to trade outside is a and so I think because now customer understand what they want to do and why the why blockchain I think this was the time earlier in the two three years before when to explain to customer key blockchain will do the trust transparency now people everyone understand those things Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we we are using um, a solution called uh, Hyperledger, Hyperledger Aries Indy um, as our uh, the underpinning technology. Um, it does involve a blockchain, uh, it, but I do you know there there is a stigma associated with blockchain, uh, which I um, Ha I try to talk to my colleagues uh, about it and to uh, others in government to let them know um, that the process efficiencies involved with the use of this technology are um, really quite incredible. Like in the use case that uh, we are, we've got um, for demonstration now, and it's included on the pamphlets that are left out on the chairs. Um, the existing process f that these companies have to go through in order to report their carbon emissions to the government, uh, it involves downloading a Word document from a website, filling it out, sending it to the auditor. The auditor uh, looks it over, checks it, adds their uh, verification of that it is uh, accurate, creates a PDF, sends it back to the company, who then has to fill out a web form um, and they have to do this for it's for this one company that's on this particular use case. It's a mine site that has one mine, but there's another company that we're we're expanding this ecosystem all the time. And so another company we're dealing with has, I think, maybe at least 15 mine sites within the province. They have to do that web form for every single mine, um, and so the opportunities for making mistakes, for errors, um, the amount of staff time that it takes to undertake this work. Um, you know, it, it does function and it, you know, the, it, the regulations are fulfilled through this process, but the, the potential for business effic efficiency is really quite, quite incredible. So. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about emerging technologies, um, when regulations um, are put forward for, uh, for example, with climate sustainability and reporting, um, we see acceleration of the development of not only the technologies themselves, but the use cases as well. Um, so Nancy, I, I know the government of British Columbia and Canada in general um, are really leading the world in regards to regulations on this topic. Can you tell us a little bit about how, what the regulations are currently um, and how that is helping you move these projects forward as well. Um, and then Kamlesh, if you could do the same in India. And I know we have uh, some slides to talk about from a European Union perspective as well. 
Yes, yeah, so uh, in British Columbia, we have very strong uh, climate legislation. We have a carbon tax. Uh, we have a number of programs that um, the uh, revenue from that carbon tax is reinvested back into projects to reduce emissions for operators. Um, and so the, uh, the, the building upon those processes uh, using um, distributed ledger technology is uh, really what we're trying to do with this, um, with this project. We also have uh, in British Columbia uh, uh, another ministry that does a ton of work around um, identity technology for individuals. So we work in close collaboration with that team uh, because the application that we're piloting is for organizations. So um, yeah, they were, they're really the visionary group within our ministry or within our government and we are, um, we are building upon that work for, to, and applying it at the organizational level. So in India perspective, uh, uh, there are some regulations like uh, extended producer responsibility so and is very strict like in india especially suppose if you're not following for suppose you generate some plastic and you are not recycling it they even can find you million dollar by ministries and uh, and that's why this all the plastic or some e-waste recycler companies are following and building some kind of trust and transparent uh, uh, system uh, where they can track and so the government and the brand who are uh, kind of intend to uh, build some kind of uh, traceability platform. Another, I mean, just mentioned about the this end of life vehicle because India is a huge country and then millions of vehicle and, and millions of vehicle recycled, need to be recycled every year. And they conjoined and created some kind of uh, framework to uh, uh, kind of intend to recycle this uh, vehicle and then how much carbon footprint it will save. This about this two things which are current existing and recently uh, government of uh, India in parliament uh, building some kind of carbon credit export uh, bill where uh, the currently like suppose the water the carbon credit generated in India is maybe available or exported to the Europe or some other countries but now India is building some kind of uh, I think is already approved in the half of the parliament and now after that like when it's passed in the secondary parliament uh, maybe October, November this year, then what are the carbon credit generated in India? It should be used and uh, offset in India only. And when this bill was officially announced by government, then all the companies or all the kind of, it will create a huge market uh, for the carbon credit and carbon offset market in India. So uh, um, I'll uh, just briefly show you some details about um, the uh, German government's um, battery passport project. So, and uh, this sort of all fits a little bit in with both other things they talked about, about the um, uh, 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 BCs, uh, the government looking into uh, tracking or people having to report certain emissions information as well as the battery life cycle. So part of this, the goal for the uh, German project is to uh, yeah, support the sustainable transition to low carbon mobility and energy storage as well as reduction in raw material extraction and dependency through increased material efficiency, lifetime extension, residual value determination and recycling. So there's a number of different um, items that this covers that is about the and so um, circular is, is one of the technology is the technology partner in this project where different work packages need is researching the amount of um, looking at the regulations determining the amount of data that's required to be reported upon and determining technical standards for this to be widely adopted um, and then it creating a demonstrator in order to uh, prove that this can work. So it, I'm just going to skip through these, but there's a number of different measures that is part of the EU battery regulations. And sort of, <clears throat> it's also looking at the tracking the, making, looking at the where materials has been resourced from um, that has been done sustainably and not in conflict areas. But then after that, 
resources were used, for example, in a battery, that they can then track the battery life cycle as well, and then determine the at the end of life, so it's not, um, it doesn't meet the requirements for electric vehicle anymore, but that battery could be reused for energy storage, the full history of that battery still exists, and that is verifiable, so that maximum use is achieved through the batteries, instead of just recycling it after a single lifetime or a single life. Um, yeah, so over time, over the next few years, there's a number of different regulations that's coming in and in increasing the um, minimum standards of what need to be reported or what need to be part of the batteries that's being produced. Yeah. I feel like I should just stand. <laughs> It'll be easier. <laughs> um, so, um, and that's gr it's great. Um, to see these projects actually fitting with timelines like this, right? Because the 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 work that Circular has been doing for uh, many years, uh, I know they've been part of the Hyperledger community since 2017, um, is really paying off quite a bit uh, as well. Um, Nancy, um, you know, verification, right? And the trust in the data is really an important aspect of it. Um, I was hoping you can um, address the question of, you know, what is a verifiable credential? And how are you using verifiable credentials as part of your uh, platform? Thanks. Yeah, so verified credentials um, are a, they're a digital version of um, physical, uh, physical credentials. So such as your driver's license, um, your birth certificate. Uh, in this case, we're using verified credentials uh, as the mechanism for the uh, sustainability reporting and the carbon uh, reporting that producers need to do uh, in British Columbia. Um, so with verified credentials, there is always an issuer of that credential, a holder of the credential, and a verifier of the credential. And in this use case, it gets a bit confusing because the word that the auditors use to check the box for the audited carbon report is also verified. So. Um, bear with me as I explain this. Uh, it is definitely one of the issues of uh, trying to map uh, an existing legislative process with, uh, an, uh, with a, technolo a new technology. Is some of the terminology can get confusing. Anyways, so the issuer in this case is the carbon auditor. It's PwC. Um, they issue the verified credential uh, from their digital wallet it's uh, the holder of the credential is the mining company or the natural gas company. Uh, they also have a, a digital wallet. Um, and then the verifier in this case is the, um, the Climate Action Secretariat, which is the regulator. Um, so the, the, um, the blockchain component of this is that the credential, uh, the verifier is able to see from the digital credential who issued it uh, when it was issued, and that it is still val valid. Um, the information that's contained on the credential is not recorded in the blockchain. Uh, so that's a really important component for privacy uh, reasons. Um, you can see that the transaction has taken place uh, on the blockchain, but you cannot access the actual data that's included on the digital credential. Uh, I can talk about the... Uh, some different thing in what is we did in a hyperledger carbon accounting project. So there we created some kind of decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, like currently, uh, whether Vera or Gold Standard, uh, Gold Standard certify the, your carbon credits. So because and this centralized authorities. So we uh, created some kind of uh, DAO plat DAO kind of uh, platform there, and instead of uh, getting certified the carbon credit via some kind of centralized registry we created uh, this uh, some decentralized registry so whoever would, would like to part of this DAO platform they could just be member of this thing and they some get some kind of uh, DAO token credit token and if suppose for example suppose uh, there is a one uh, renewable energy project in Maharashtra is uh, maybe running I suppose it's generating maybe suppose suppose thousand metric ton CO2 saving so Currently, process like someone need to uh, 
submit the project to the where our gold is tender and they will certify like this the actual savings but part of this dow thing uh, which is running running in production in uh, climate action accounting group so there you can uh, simply uh, what are the already the member of the dow they can vote for the particular project like this is a genuine or not and then on the basis of this dow's conclusion voting uh, mechanism it automatically issue that carbon credit to the tokens to the particular uh, project so this i think is interesting thing in the this particular project okay so one i've had the pleasure of spending the last 3 days with nancy and the conversations that we've been having with other members and other government agencies as well um, about using these technologies as part of their projects. Nancy, I was wondering if you can help the audience understand the role of government in building these technologies and actually, you know, the government of British Columbia is actually contributing to the open source projects, right? A lot of the contributions are coming from within the government or are also being supported by the government in the ecosystem. Tell us a little bit about that and the kind of conversations that you've had here at Open Source Summit and at the Hyperledger Foundation event um, around um, yeah, around using the technology and how how do you how do you get governments involved and at the table building uh, alongside with the private sector? Um, so you may have noticed that I do not have a technical background. Um, I'm, I have a policy and strategy background, so I'm very new to the whole concept of distributed ledger technology, open source software. Um, something that has been really mind blowing for me since I've been at this conference and the Hyperledger conference beforehand was that I was hearing from governments, other governments, that they are using the software that the BC government has inputted into the open source uh, Hyperledger Aries and Indy, that they that it has begun being of use for them and that they are actually creating their own solutions based on that software. Um, I knew that we had really world-class folks working for us, but that kind of validation from the United Nations, from the government of Rhode Island, uh, has been very um, humbling for me. Uh, it has also uh, made me realize that the open source model is really one that I think governments, it, it just aligns so well with government's objectives around um, going, moving forward to the public good, using this t these technologies in a way that is gonna be of most benefit to citizens and uh, companies uh, who are active within the economy of your jurisdiction um, and being able to, uh, you know, work together with other governments around the world through the open source um, model uh, to develop solutions that are um, applicable in so many different use cases. Like we have one here, but there's all sorts of uh, other use cases for uh, that we're working on as well, but also for individual identity. Um, I think the possibilities for digital government um, and for just making the lives of citizens and uh, companies uh, better is, um, it's, it's very inspiring. It's very cool to be part of it. Uh, sorry, just, uh, yeah, I think as part of that, that's quite good because the, if, other, if a government contributes and other governments can see that and then they can start to contribute as well. Yeah. So, and it's all taxpayers' money that goes into this. So they don't have to reinvent the wheel, exactly. but there's, it's open source, but there, there's a little bit of extra credibility that's given like another government has endorsed this as well. Mm -hmm. So that's really good adoption and a way this is going. Well, Conrad, I was gonna ask you, you know, why open source? When you made a decision, when Circular made a decision on what software to use, why, why open source and why does it matter? Um, what, um, yeah, so we when we started, we compared a few different um, solutions, and um, luckily, Apple's Fabric was one of those that came out just at the right time. Um, and it's I think for us, it we because it there's cost, there's trust, there's different components that's part of it, and other gas fees or other things is in part of the consideration as well, and just the amount of support and. Um, availability of some of these technologies just made the open source hyperledger fabric the easy choice. 
Kamlesh, you're very active in the hyperledger community um, as a leader within the technical steering committee. You're also very active in the climate action special interest group that you mentioned before. Tell the audience a little bit about why it matters for you and for your company and the customers that you work with that um, participation and contribution to an open source foundation um, is really beneficial. So I think um, being a member of any open source community, I think is uh, add value to your uh, credibility in the in the in the market or like for example, if you if you are a member of Hyperledger Foundation and when you talk to the customer, can customer get the confidence like uh, uh, okay, uh, Kamlesh and his company is part of the Hyperledger Foundation and they have an indirect connection and talk talk to the customer and uh, talk to the founder uh, foundation people, and I think. So only uh, customer who are implementing uh, some solution, they need some kind of confidence because when come to the open source, generally, I, I think now in this not senior, but earlier people think like open source is free or maybe how much is sustainable, is mature or not, it, it will work or not. So, but now the things are maturing, uh, not just the blockchain thing, but uh, what are the other open source, other Kubernetes, we can take example, Cloud Native Foundation. So, all these are kind of mature products and now companies, even even the government especially are looking for the open source project. They don't want to go with some kind of uh, any licensed software. Even even I talk to many customers, uh, they're generally looking at a, a Hyperledger fabric or Hyperledger Indiaries. Even I know many, custom, many government initiatives, they only look for the Hyperledger based technology instead of going to maybe some kind of R3 Coda, for example, or maybe some kind of public blockchains. Because in terms of maturity or in terms of the now the how the foundation built in the last uh, couple of years. Now we're getting close to the end. And I thought maybe we can open for some questions from the audience for the next five minutes. Um, I think we have five minutes left, correct? Um, any questions for the audience from the audience? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I, I will paraphrase and correct me if I don't get it quite right. But um, I, it's the question was around um, how heavy of a lift is it of a, as a government to undertake a project like this? Um, I would say that it's it's been a real learning curve. Um, the uh, the folks, the stakeholders who were uh, in and wanted to be a part of the pilot from the beginning, totally dedicated, so excited about it. Like zero effort to get them involved. They were pushing it forward. Um, other stakeholders within government and external to government who are a key co parts of that trust triangle that I was talking about, the issuer, holder, and verifier. Um, it, for some of them, it was more moderate effort, You know, educating them about what we were doing, what we weren't doing can't tell you how many times I've been asked, why are you getting involved in cryptocurrency? <laughs> You're using blockchain. So that's the level of understanding for some people. They don't realize that there's actually multiple different uses of this technology. Um, and then for, for some uh, folks, it's been a really quite a, an extensive lift. Uh, it's been a bit of a, we've had to do a bit of a long play uh, for them to realize that, um, you know, they're, to see that we are continuing with the work and that there is benefit to it and uh, to be able to articulate that to them. We really, uh, something that we did midway through the pilot, so after the first year, is that we have the technology team, we have an entire team now that's built for communications, change management, business analysis, policy analysts to understand the legislation, 
Um, and then, uh, and that was, we built that into the business case for the second year. That's made an int a huge difference because the technology, the quality of, the, of what we're building has remained the same, but now we can actually, we know how to talk to people about it. And that's made an, a, a huge difference for us. Any other questions? How about a closing statement, right? The call, the call to action is a very important one when it comes to, to climate. I think every single person in the world, of course, is going to be affected. Um, just a last statement around why this is so important um, for us to work together, um, but primarily of why this is a technology opportunity um, versus an, uh, opportun uh, a technology weight that we're putting in on the planet. Um, so I think because a lot, a lot of this is driven by governments and institutions, like they want to optimize their supply chains, although they want to see um, further away from them. And actually, because they become responsible, it's, it's not just one tier and you forget about it, but because it's affecting everybody, it need to help, um, they need to find a way to have that trust, but also be able to have the visibility throughout. So, and open source technologies like Hyperledger Fabric and the security around it can help to implement those things. I think a big portion still is the education because a lot of people yeah, think blockchain is cryptocurrency or tokens and it's expensive and it takes lots of energy to actually do it. And so the education part, but we've seen in the last four years that initially there are a lot of questions where now it's much more not it, it's easy to talk to them about it and you talk about the solutions and then yeah so in general i think it's um it helps with that trust and transparency yeah uh, i would say for us it's really been uh diving into a use case and piloting it and learning from it and framing it as a learning experience for government um and on that to that note, you know, we're very happy to talk to other governments. We're happy to talk to, um, you know, all different levels of government to share our knowledge. Uh, we really um, have learned a ton already about uh, how w what the benefits are of implementing a technology like this to a particular use case. Uh, we're happy to share information. Um, yeah, I had something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember. So I'm gonna pass it to Manish. Yeah. Okay. So I think sustainability is the need of today. I think everyone understand the climate change, global warming, and uh, and how blockchain can play an important role. Because if you are not uh, accounting properly the carbon emission footprint, you can't be uh, reaching and targeting your uh, uh, net zero goals of carbon foot, carbon savings. So in blockchain, I believe like uh, after supply chain and financial services, the next uh, domain of the blockchain. Would with the will in the climate action accounting. It has multiple use cases from sustainable sustainable market, sustainable agriculture to uh, greenhouse gas emission savings or carbon carbon uh, accounting or climate or plastic recycle, battery passport and uh, and uh, I think everywhere easy compliance is a bigger thing. So I think is going to be great uh, next 10, 20 years in the particular this space and the blockchain could play a very important role. Do you remember what I was going to say? Yeah. So I get asked a lot, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And um, I actually think that the better question is what opportunity are we trying to go for? Because I think that there are incredible benefits to be realized for citizens and companies uh, using this technology. Um, and I think that, you know, you don't, a lot of people don't know what the, what the issue or how much better it could be. Uh, for their systems, so. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, the panelists, thank you, uh, the attendees. If you have any questions, I'm sure the panelists will be happy to take additional questions as well. Um, and we will go ahead and put the case study and the slides, if you're okay with it, on the sketch so that people online have access to that as well. Thank you.